Ready? Yeah, just give it two good claps. Perfect. That register on all mics. Good job. All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. We've got a whole host of people here today, a bunch of podcast alum. Everybody here has been on the podcast before, so this is pretty slick. Uh, I'm going to let everybody introduce themselves, so starting with my left. Uh, Kyle Lauberger with the Native Habitat Project. Yes, sir. Anthony Tron Kiley, Jacob's uncle. <laughs> Alan Summerford with Native Habitat Project and Landon Legacy. Jacob Myers, the one and only. Oh, man, it does sound weird. He's not in our headphones, so that was kind of underwhelming. Yep. I'm not going to lie. Old Jacob Myers. Um, so this is this has been a podcast that's been, I guess, a couple weeks in the making now. Uh, we actually filmed a bunch of stuff with you guys, Kyle and Alan. Uh, you came down here to the farm. If people are longtime listeners, they've heard about the farm before. Uh, we've done a podcast with you, Anthony, about this place. And this is kind of where Jacob grew up hunting, so people have heard a lot of stories about that. And uh, we got you guys to come down here to look at the, the native habitat, the, the prairies that are here, I guess you would call it. And uh, just kind of basically see what he had, and then we were all going to get together and talk about it. And we're going to talk about that big old humongous buck behind Jacob that, uh, that Anthony you shot out here last year, old high tower. So people heard us talk about that on the podcast a couple weeks ago. But uh, I guess to start us off, Jacob, do you want to kind of give a rundown of, of the property and everything, and and kind of your thought process behind this? Because you're kind of the one that set it all up. Yeah. So this is a uh, again the family farm, uh, Anthony's property. Uh, kind of grew up hunting. I shot my first deer here. Um, actually, I th- shot my first two deer on this property. And um, growing up, this is the only place we had to hunt, other than like y'all had hunting clubs that we went yeah. to a couple times, you and, 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 uh, and uh, Michael a couple times, but n- never really had any success. Um, so this is our the, the family form that, Anthony, you kind of grew up on with your grandparents, my great grandparents were here. Uh, so there's a ton of family history on this place. Um, and previously, like when we grew up here, it was, mostly all pines there's a lot of isolated oaks on this property and we had an episode anthony with you talk about hunting isolated oaks and this is kind of the starting ground of that of where you kind of learn that skill set uh for early season bow hunting the whole nine yards and with all that um since then about i think you said how many years is it how many years ago that this place get cut 2012 2012 so 11 years ago uh this property got cut pretty heavily cut and since then it, it had been kind of nothing had really been done with that the actual the timber on the property kind of let, let everything regen um but this property's produced some really nice deer and recently last year you shot this buck which all the viewers can see which is high tower which anthony actually i want to put it you can sit it next to you, you sit high towers right next to you <laughs> uh, 139 and six eighths uh eight point that's probably i think he's 13 and a half inches wide uh, and that's after drying uh that deer is a, a freaking freak for down here but the craziest thing about that deer, and this is going to be kind of what we're talking about on the, the podcast today, is the body size of that deer. That deer dressed out, no guts, no hawks on his on front or back legs, 187 pounds at Weaver's when we took him up there, uh, which is a monster for down here body-wise. So that deer is probably, I don't know, 215, 220 potentially. Um, and it's just incredible how big that deer was compared to a lot of the other deer that's been killed out here. Um, but the habitat's really kind of transformed over the last really few months because this property was extremely overgrown, uh, just with a ton of sweet gums, pines had come back in the whole nine yards and you actually rented some equipment, a skid steer, uh, with a brush cutter on the front of it and cleared out a ton of stuff, which a lot of people think of like, why would you, you know, that some of our deer hunters be like, well, why, you you know, taking out the thick cover. Okay. And this is why we got Kyle and Allen here. Um, the thick cover wasn't providing anything for these white tails. Um, and it, it's been crazy to see what species have come back since you brush cut. But before we kind of get into the, the nitty gritty there, cause again, Kyle, or, or Kyle and Alan, y'all have done now two tours of the property. We've walked it twice and uh, found some really cool species and it's really kind of an interesting property. But before we dive into that, Anthony, can you talk about, you know, how long have you owned the property and what was this property before you actually owned it when you kind of were growing up as a kid on this place? Well, my granddad, grandparents bought it in 1955. Uh, it was cows. I can remember born in 1970. I can remember coming here when I was knee high and the cows would, this was the original house here. The cows would actually come up to the, to the house. So it was just a cattle farm, not a tree on it except for the the oaks that are standing now Mm -hmm. and uh that's about it you know it's just 
just a cattle farm. Oh, how big was, was the property any bigger or was it the same size as this? Did they have more acreage back then? It was the road. I think originally the road had it was dirt. Mm -hmm. So he owned 10 acres across the road. That that was it, 100 acres total. Mm -hmm. So it's just 90 acres now. Uh, he wouldn't let us hunt it with, with rifles because we had cows, black Angus cattle. So we networked with people in the church and we dog hunted around the property. Kimberly Clark owned everything around it, uh, drum and coal. So we got permits and I grew up dog hunting. Mm -hmm. So uh, I bought the property in 97. My granddad uh, developed colon cancer so we moved him back up to Hueytown, where I'm from. And so I bought the property in 97 and been just working a little bit, you know, since then. Now, when you got the property, it was mostly pasture other than the isolated white oh, oaks pasture. and some of the cedars that were kind of, like you can tell us there's, there's some bigger cedars out here, but mostly just isolated oak trees, red and white oaks. Mm -hmm. um, and it was all pasture land. What did you do to the property when you first got it in your hands as in like planning i didn't do anything I, mean, I didn't know anything i was a dog hunter you know so i started learning and actually a buddy of mine we came down the first fields that were ever installed we did with a front tine tiller it took us weeks to do a little small <laughs> big as this room you know grain field <laughs> But we did with a front tine tiller. So, you know, just start learning things. I bought my first tractor when I was, I think, 19 or 20 years old. Still living at home with the parents. And uh, so started, you know, gradually learning and expanding fields, putting in fields. And so it just went from there. Now, when did you plant pines on the property? Plant pines that are up on top of the big hill in 2003, and then plant pines in 2007. Now those were, that's nothing that I harvested. Mm -hmm. Everything I harvested was just regen. That was all regen? Yeah. Oh yeah. That's fascinating, because growing up it was all pine, like this whole place was nothing but pine trees yeah. other than the lanes that were cut for you know the tractor and the little food plots, that was it. Yeah. So I didn't realize so it was, was all no region. timber bay. When I cut it, mm -hmm. I was just cutting it to reach start over. So, yeah, it, it, there was nothing here. When I cut it, the only pine standing there still up there on the hill. I don't know if y'all videoed any of that, but I hand planted all that mm -hmm. in 03. Planted that whole hill side, but beavers took every one of those pines. They got four foot tall. And I was beating my chest, man, this is so awesome. Two weeks later, come back, there wasn't one standing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious, I was so mad, dude. So I went beaver hunting, you know, after that. But uh, so that was the only trees remaining mm -hmm. from when I planted actual lob lollies. Well, one thing that's important is to talk about uh, the region of the state that we're in. So we're in Bibb County. Uh, Bibb County is kind of a special place, and this is something, Kyle, maybe you can kind of talk about kind of regionally why Bibb County is so uh, important when it comes to the state, when it comes to habitat diversity and some of the different species that are found here. But that's something that's kind of fascinating about this property because there's a ton of exposed limestone on this property. And we've seen that a bunch walking around. So Kyle, what is like your take? Now you've seen it after we've, our Anthony's cut literally the whole farm as in the pines, everything else has been regen and has come up afterwards. He came through and brush cut it, but just like all the exposed limestone and stuff, like how is that something special to like this area of the state or just part of Alabama? Yeah, um, and don't hold me to this, but I think it's a dolomite limestone. And so, uh, if you've heard of the Lost World of Bibb County, um, it's uh, it's on the side of Alabama's U-Haul trucks, and uh, it's I guess in the '90s, I think they found, gosh, it was. It was at least like eight, maybe more than that, but new species to science on this little dolomite glade along the Cahaba River, and uh, it's a lot of lot of species that depend on uh, this type of limestone um, in general. I mean, there's a, 
just limestone in general, there's a lot of species that depend on it, but dolomite limestone specifically hosts, I mean, these specific plants, and and that's why you find uh, really rare, important plants on that kind of exposed limestone ecosystem. So Now, something interesting about that, you'd think of exposed limestone, exposed rock as terrible wildlife habitat. You know, I think from an outside, look, outside perspective looking in, you see all these exposed rocks like, dude, this is terrible soil. You know, there's no, there's no good, you know, plant species here for like, you know, putting mass onto your body weight, the whole nine yards, you know, carrying capacity for quail and, and, and um, you know, turkeys, the whole nine yards. But what we've come to realize that's not the case after doing a walk on this property and also kind of learning from you and Alan of some of the species we found out here since Anthony's brought that brush cutter out and literally transformed this farm. Because when I came out here back in, say, November, when we tracked your buck, tracked Hightower, we found, you know, you found Hightower. It, it was still thick, overgrown, because after it had been cut back in 2011, or, yes, no, 2000, 12. what year was 12. it? 2012. You kind of just let the place go. Like, it didn't really, there was no, there was a little bit of fire in certain spots, but it wasn't widely burned, no herbicide use, so a lot of it got really, really crazy thick and under, and thick understory, which I think a lot of places do if people don't pay attention to it. A lot of people, it seems like, get a property clear cut and they don't know what to do with it. The next thing they know, they've got a, a small stand forest growing and you know that we really know what to do with that but anthony you came in and cleared all of it or cleared a lot of it out with that brush cutter and we're finding species out here that uh, as kyle maybe you can kind of talk about it's very very super high quality specifically prairie species that are out here that offer a ton for a bunch of different wildlife species yeah um I, i've seen more uh goats rue than i think i've seen on any property ever um but goats rue boykins milkwort butterfly weed tons of gamma grass um black-eyed susans and sensitive briar um red ring milkweed um just flower but yeah illinois bundle flower that's a great one um tons of just high quality prairie plants rosin weeds and uh just list goes on and on i mean it's a ton of ton of great species and that's from bringing in sunlight and uh these have just been hanging out here for you know forever and and now they're now they're thriving again because they've got all that sunlight. So it's only going to get better as you bring fire back into this, this under this property. That's what they really crave. And so you bring fire back into it, um, they're just going to keep multiplying, and and you're going to sustain this like early, like I guess early successional type habitat. It's not really like the stuff you see in old grow like um, old pasture type settings, but it's stuff you see in high quality uh, prairies, and it's just going to constantly improved down the road so when you're talking about the you know the rocky soil and everything i've grown up on a cattle farm my whole entire life none of my soil is like that most of my soil is really rich fertile soil and so there's a lot more that happens in that type of soil because people will will disc up and they will plant and you can get equipment over it so you spray it and all of those things whereas in an area like this where you've got the limestone that hinders you from using tractors to disturb it and sometimes it has some of the most awesome diverse species that you that you lose in those other areas Mm -hmm. and species that aren't just cool to look at but actually add a ton of value for wildlife species yeah absolutely yeah tons of legumes out here i mean native legumes like there's desmodiums and tick treffles and illinois bundle flower and you know um, goat's root i mean tons and tons of uh different native um, species and legumes that can be browsed on by deer that are going to flower and attract a ton of insects i mean every sensitive briar we came across was just getting there was insects just i mean hovering around the whole plant is crazy and so they're that's insects for quail and turkey um so they're they're flowering attracting insects they're forage for deer and they're creating seeds they're these little beans they're dropping in the fall and that's turkey food and quail food can can you explain what a, a legume is, um, and, and like in a way that a lot of deer hunters probably be familiar with? Yeah, it's like a like a deer hunters are probably familiar with like soybeans and cow peas. Is that's a clover? Just, clover, yeah, clover is a legume, and um, vetches and I guess vetches a legume, right? Yeah, it is. And so these are, those are nitrogen fixtures, and and so the thing is, is with a lot of those, maybe not clover, a lot of those are annuals. You have to plant them every year. These native ones are perennials, so they're once they're there, they're there. And as long as you maintain the type of habitat that they like to thrive in, 
open canopy and and uh you know you use fire those plants will stay there forever they'll keep multiplying on their own and they're perennials so you don't have to plant them every year that's that's free food and it's uh you know if a uh, food plot company sold this they'd be out of business in a couple of years so well the legumes are are great in the deer world because you're seeking that high protein rich food source and the, mm-hmm. so you've got native legumes that are really really high in protein as well and so they're yep. free yep I, w- I want to talk about uh alan the first time we did a walk on this property we were down looking at the legumes in this one spot and identifying a different uh, a couple different kinds of them and you were talking about the soybeans that that are on the farm here and the difference between like the soybeans right now it's mid-june and they're two three inches tall but those native legumes that we were finding like down in the bottoms and, and in the prairies or whatever they've been growing since like march right growing so green up so yep. can you kind of rehash that kind of dive into that about why that's important for antler development I guess probably fawn development. I mean, just the overall health of your deer herd. Right. So I kind of noticed this whenever our, which was a cattle farm, um, got converted into a row crop farm. And I thought, man, this is going to be the most amazing thing ever because now we've got row crops Mm -hmm. that I do not have to plant or manage or do anything to. And it was kind of, you know, it wasn't as good as I had hoped for. And what I started realizing was, is, you know, a lot of times, the corn you know it's doing nothing to grow antlers from the whole entire time it's in the ground so it's basically you can just write it off it's not growing antlers it might be a okay food source you know in the fall or whatever but then the soybeans they would spray these fields out these fields would get sprayed out in february um our deer start dropping our horns down there in march a lot of times well these fields would be sprayed out from february early february all the way until you know, late May, when they start planting beans, well, then those beans are still, you know, little bitty. They're they're tiny. They're, they've got two leaves all the way into June. And, man, the deer have already, a lot of our bucks have already got their G2 started by the time the beans are even doing anything. So I realized then it's not your soybeans growing your deer. It's your natives that have been here starting to grow. And, and as soon as things green up in March, they're already putting on, leaves they're already putting on you know new growth and everything and then by the time june gets here most of the ones we saw here are already knee high i mean producing way more if i told i told jacob i said man you grab a bucket and i'll go i'll go i'll grab a bucket and i'll go pick the native legumes and you pick these in this food plot right here and we'll see who gets done first mm-hmm. and it's a huge difference mm-hmm. in the amount of forage that the the natives are providing as opposed to the food plot yeah, and, it, and it's so dense, too, because that bean field, it's like, here's a bean sprout, here's a bean sprout. Yes. You know, you can kind of walk down that line, but out in the prairie, it's just like, you just grab a handful wherever everywhere you, look. you look. Yeah, literally everywhere you look. Uh, so, I, I, I mean, I just kind of found that fascinating. And, and real quick, I want to get more into the farm and what we saw here and, and the status of this place. But I also want to rehash early in this conversation the idea of uh, what it takes to feed a deer mm. um, in a savanna type habitat versus like a closed campy forest. Um, so uh, either one of y'all, I guess, like kind of rehash how much does it take to feed like a, a buck or a doe and what do different habitats produce? I'll go. Uh, so, you know, it takes like 2000 pounds of food a year to, to, for a doe to survive. And so in your open prairie grassland type settings where you have a lot of forbs, you've got like 2,000, 2,500 pounds of food per acre. And in a closed canopy um, situation, you know, you know, anywhere from 50 to 100. And, you know, in the best, like like Alan says, the best setting, you know, you got 250 pounds an acre of, of uh, food in a closed canopy forest. And so in a savanna, you have, you know, those hard mass producing trees like you'd have in a closed canopy forest and soft mass producing trees. And you also have, that forage in the understory, that grassland component that has a lot of food, um, you know, things maturing at different times for those deer. And then you've also got woody browse. You've also got hard mass from those big oaks. And then you've got food for everything else too, quail, turkey, and uh, frogs, lizards, anything else, you know, songbirds. And then you've also got fawning habitat, nesting habitat, brooding habitat. I mean, it's like a whole package. I feel like savannas are like the, you know, the most productive ecosystem we have in the southeast 
and uh, you're kind of covering all your bases with one type of ecosystem. Well, but, and with a savanna too, your your deer are not just surviving. A lot of times you go into closed canopy timber and you see things that deer don't normally eat, yet they are bla- browsing the cr- the mess out of it because they're starving to death, yeah. and that's just the only thing they have to eat. Whereas if you go in the savanna setting, it it takes a deer from just going into survival mode into going into they're thriving. Yeah. They're 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 expressing genes like this that they weren't able to express because now they're they're able to start they're 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 coming out of the winter in a better condition where they start putting on, you know, mass on their on their antlers whereas before they were just growing a rack. Well, now mm-hmm. with all the food that they can eat starting at an earlier time, now they're able to express those genes that they've been held back because they were just starving to death. Yeah, and th- and that being said, you know, as savannas are awesome but you still want a you know you want diversity on your property you want different types of grasslands you want open prairie you want you know you got limestone glades here you've got um you know woodlands which have more of a shrub component you got savannas which are have an understory of grasslands having that all that diversity throughout the property is really important and then managing each of those um, breaking each of those up into different sections and managing them different applying fire at different times that really promotes diversity even amongst one type of ecosystem, you have one savanna, you know, with post oaks and short leaves and black jacks, you know, all these upland hardwoods and pines um, spread out. And these things are spaced out far enough to where they could fall and not hit each other. Um, but there's grass underneath and you can split that up and the whole thing looks the same across it, but you can burn it at different times. And so then you're maybe one part of it has more native grasses. One part of it has more forbs. And one part of it has been freshly burned. So, like on Alan's property, he talks about, you know, turkeys, turkey poults. They can't carry them. They can't just like pick up those poults and carry them miles away. They've got a little. They got to follow that mother around. And then, if that you know that hen's got got to have that right habitat for those poults within walking distance. And so, when you give that mosaic of different types of grassland ecosystems on a property, you're really setting it up to to uh, for wildlife to have everything they have in one spot. I've got a couple things I want to, I want Kyle, I want you to answer. First off, what is a savanna? Like what components makes a savanna for people that don't understand that? It, and then also explain like what are the components of a prairie and how do they differ? Yeah, so think of a closed canopy forest and, you know, so dense that sunlight can't get through. And then you it opens up a little bit and you've got spaces, you know, in between those trees and you have a shrub component, that's a woodland. And then think of, you know, spaced out trees far enough to where they can't fall into each other, but you have grassland underneath, that's a savanna. And then wide open prairie, which we had in Alabama, we had a lot of areas that were wide open prairie, not a tree in sight. That's a prairie. And then you've got, um, there's there's tons of different kinds of grasslands, bogs, swamps, and glades. And, and I mean, there's tons of different types of grassland ecosystems, but um ours in alabama was really a mosaic um you would have those forests down in your um you know your hollers your river bottoms your north slopes um your you know ravines that's where those forests would have been places that would have held moisture and fire wouldn't have wouldn't have been as prevalent but your grasslands and your savannas would have been on your ridge tops your south slopes your east and west slopes places that were drier and so when a fire came through that fire burned really hot going through there and knocked back woody vegetation and and uh, maintained it as a grass or savanna and that is really a mosaic it kind of changed throughout you know you were getting it was just a patchwork of different types of grassland ecosystems and when you're managing a property you want to keep that in mind you don't want to try to put a savanna yeah. mm-hmm. down in a bottom against a creek or you know different things like that so you're, you're going to use the land what it wants to be and promote that different slope aspect or is it a riparian buffer is it wet is it dry is it rocky is it you know those different type of things you're going to go to a property and you're going to try to manage it for what it wanted to be historically yeah unless it's like a bottom on your place where it's open and it just floods periodically yeah that's a different kind of bottom land that would have been a grassland or savanna kind of but uh alan can you describe the topography of this property after walking a couple times and kind of like how does it how does this property set up compared to like a property that was a lot more flatter? Cause I know you got some properties that are really flat. 
just with that topography on this property, how you can have a mix of these different habitats all in one property that's only 90 acres. Right. So, I mean, this would be what I would consider a gently rolling hills type of property. It doesn't have anything super, super steep or not a ton of elevation change, but you can literally just walk across these hills and you get on one edge of it and it looks totally different when you go on the other edge of it, all because of the slope, the way the slope is facing, what what type of sunlight it gets. Um, you know, and then you got these small little, just not really even a creek or a drainage. You don't even see anything where water would run, but it's just a seep and it just stays a little damper, a little moisture. And then you got a lot bigger, more trees in those type of areas. And, you know, you've got a lot more diversity on a property that has a little bit of hill because just because of the angle of sunlight coming down to it. Whereas if you've got a whole entire flat land, like what a lot of my place is, is flat. Um, you don't have that slope aspect to change. It's going to be more <clears throat> soil types. Mm -hmm. And um, in, in the flatlands, you'll have one soil type right next to another soil type. And one area grows trees, one area does not. Um, so that's the differences. Yeah. And also another thing about this property, we didn't mention this for the listeners uh, or the viewers as well, but since this property has been clear cut and even with uh, Anthony coming back through it and you know, brush cutting a lot of this, you know, really doing a uh, very extensive cutting on the property, it's probably 70-ish percent open maybe and 30 percent closed or like more closed canopy some stuff that needs you know more fire and stuff to kind of manage through it with a bunch of isolated oaks throughout the property and some small stands of, of pines have been planted but nothing extensive but for the average person they look at this property and the average deer hunter is thinking like dude you need a whole you know expanse of white oaks or like you know you want all these mass trees and i think a lot of people go to that it's like you know they want to buy a property it's this huge upland hardwoods because uh, they think like that's what grows big bucks and I mean Alan we, we kind of mentioned this last time we had you on but like your property in Tennessee was like that yeah. and you came through and did a, a pretty heavy select cut opening up more savannah and it's made a big difference and, and one thing we didn't mention on your, po on your podcast but you even saw a body weight difference between the deer before you cut and then Absolutely. after you cut so let's talk about that because that's a big proponent of this podcast with like Hightower how big that, bu buck, that buck was body weight wise but seeing that progress with other bucks and hopefully the does as well, um, and us kind of keeping track of that. But what, what did you see on your property before and after the cut when it came to body size of deer? So when we first got the property, there had been some clear cuts on it that were probably somewhere in a 10 year old range. So they had already gone back to closed canopy. Um, the rest of the timber was just gigantic, beautiful, wide oak after wide oak after wide oak. I mean, just trees you couldn't reach around, gigantic trees, long, tall timber. And I remember when we first got there, man, there's so many deer there. And, like, I almost felt bad. I, I knew it needed, man, we need to do a huge doe harvest. But I almost felt bad of killing a doe in September when bow season would open up, which was one of the better times to do it. Man, they were bones, skin and bones. Like, you felt bad even shooting one because there was no meat. And but we we shot them anyway. And, uh, and just years and years and years of just shooting the does and knocking the herd back but where when things really turned around is when we opened up the canopy so we had already been doing the doe harvest um and you know they were getting a little bit better they weren't skin and bones anymore but when we would kill a mature doe they would be about 85 pounds i mean like the biggest doe in the field you think that's the one i want to shoot you shoot her she's 85 pounds which was a lot smaller than what i was used to killing in alabama and um uh, we went from killing does that were 85 pounds to now just your average does will weigh 120 and just in a couple of years and you know, we didn't we didn't slack up on the doe harvest when we did the timber harvest mm -hmm. we continued to pound the does even during the timber harvest and then our bucks also started we started gaining mass i mean we started out seeing deer more like these you know, a little more spindly type horns. They would have some time length to them. Really nice deer. They never had mass. Mm -hmm. And then now we're killing deer with absolute mass. I mean, really, really, really good deer. So I want to mention this as well. A lot of people think, well, you know, they sell this marketing for supplemental food. Supplemental food, pushing supplemental food throughout the year. Oh, I had a lot of food plots. But when I'm talking like pellet food or like, oh, so like yeah, protein yeah. pellets, like that kind of stuff, they see the marketing behind it not really understanding like the the browse structure maybe y'all can kind of mention this like how much deer actually forge 
like yeah. you know their components of their forage and based off like what they're going to be feeding on but you're not putting necessarily like supplemental food out it is truly opened up that canopy and all that forage is coming up that those deer can pound on and, and eat and you've knocked a lot of does back which is super helpful as well but because of that you know that uh i guess recipe y'all put together allowed for a super super healthy deer herd and allowed those deer to be able to put on body weight you know considerable body weight you're talking you know a mature doe like biggest doe in the field being 85 pounds and so now the average doe is 120 pounds yeah. i'm sure you're, some of your bigger does are bigger than that and your bucks i'm sure did the same thing and they put more mass on literally just by opening up the canopy and putting more sunlight there for more food throughout the whole property and that probably is not super big it's 160 acres that's no, about 300 300 acres but still so y'all did that on that property and was able to provide that high quality food source throughout the whole season versus putting in a few full a few food pot few i can't talk food plots and and dealing with uh the excess of uh deer browse because there was nothing else for them other than you know when oaks were dropping right so you know that's a an interesting component that i really want to kind of highlight in this podcast and this is kind of the reason why we're doing this is because you know growing up on this farm like we were growing up in like the biggest buck i've ever seen get killed out here i think live weight might have been 175 75 pounds yeah, that, that deer right there that yeah. was a big deer. and um and that was live weight. that wasn't gutted nothing like that and you know that's kind of what we thought was like the norm but after seeing this property cut and you start seeing bucks on trail camera like that big 10 you had last year that yeah. old boy next door killed was a tank yeah. huge body deer and it's like it's coming more and more common because i feel like the opening of the canopy and what this property is able to provide which gives i feel like a private landowner you know that you don't have enough guys talking about what y'all are doing. I know, like, Lane and Legacy, Matt and, uh, and uh, Adam talk about this, but Kyle, I know you're a huge proponent just for overall, just, you know, overall, you know, habitat restoration. But it's amazing to see what this has provided, and I'm super excited to see what this does, this property does over the next coming years, especially as we put more fire on the ground and seeing how it even opens up even more so. Um, Anthony, I, I want to ask you, what have you seen, maybe some of the biggest difference in the last few years? Uh, again, the property looked way different last year than it does right now just because of how much you opened it up but just over the overall like deer herd numbers and everything like that and that kind of component and the buck numbers because you always seem to have bucks here early season you know there's bash groups on the property some mature bucks and they kind of disperse and you'll have more come back to the rut but like how have you felt the properties changed in the last few years on the property versus maybe you know 10 15 20 years ago well i mean <clears throat> back in the day i mean there was no deer here you know it, surrounding me was all just pine plantation so once we cut and everything i mean you saw i mean my eyes were open having kyle and alan here on what is a food source i mean so we we start seeing a lot more deer and we've got the buck numbers uh i mean i could name off you know 13 14 different bucks trail cams what have you uh, you know, four or five shooters in the mix. Mm -hmm. So it, it really has increased the deer population. Yeah. One thing, too, we and Kyle were talking about, um, you know, having a neighbor around that's kind of doing the same thing is a, a huge key. But then you creating that, it's going to be a place where bucks are going to want to disperse, too. Um, it, the 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 biggest best bucks are going to disperse to the highest quality forage and highest quality habitat they mm. can find and if you are that guy you're going to be drawing the the greatest deer around mm -hmm. yeah that that also brings up something anthony what jacob just asked you reminds me of my mentor ben george he used to hunt a place where he had like a it was like a gas line basically that ran through this area and it was like a long very long straightaway on this gas line that he would rifle hunt and it kind of separated two big land masses and there's a variety of landowners on either side of it and he he used to talk about he and he hunted this for like 25 30 years and he talked about how over time there'd be like a timber harvest over here and then within the next like five years there'd be an uptick like he would see better bucks and he would kill like bigger deer and then that would kind of age out and it would it would go back to normal like deer would be skinnier not as much mass kind of like what you were just talking about alan and then there'd be another cut happen somewhere else and the whole process would restart and then uh, like years ago right before he lost this place he uh i think there were several cuts like on both sides like a lot of stuff got cut at one time and there was just like a lot of open ground on both sides of both land masses basically 
And he killed a giant, man. I mean, he killed a giant in that spot. And so I was I was actually getting ready to ask you, like, if you've ever seen something similar. Because I noticed I put the drone up and I was flying the drone around this property. Yeah. I noticed two of your neighbors yeah. have done cuts. Um, so as, as you've seen your neighbors cut in the past, like, has that had a huge impact on this property? I mean, we talked about your your property itself getting cut, but what about your neighbors? Yeah, I mean, this is going to be huge. This Paul is actually, that's that's her two Both tracks. Both of them? Yeah. So it's going to help me with the isolated oak factor because that was virgin timber. I mean, it was just loaded with oaks and uh, big, you know, big white oaks, big red oaks, a variety. So as far as that aspect, that's going to help. Uh, you know, like Alan was saying when we was walking around, three or four years, that's going to be good. You know, that new clear cut as far as, generating some fit food and bedding but once it closes up like this place was you know that's gonna kind of halt the mm. the deer there and then it'll draw here as long as i keep doing what i'm doing because paula she doesn't do any fires or you know along with 95 like percent of the other people mm -hmm. in the yeah. state mm -hmm. yeah they they get a check and walk away and yeah. then it just whatever it goes or they plant it back in pines. Yeah, yeah. two thirds of a realm is, you know, is timber. I mean, they they do it for timber. They will run a fire through it occasionally, but you know they're not. Yeah. You know, and they they come in and select cut. You know, and that helps get some sunlight to the ground. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, right now it's it's pretty thick. Yeah, tight canopy. That that's that's like the name of the game for us hunting public ground all the time. Is I think I was talking to Tiffany about this one time actually, where she's like, "Well, I thought you hunted over here." I'm like, "It, it aged out, you know." Yeah. Like we'll go to a place. Jacob had a cutover that we used to hunt oh, on the, a place that I almost just said the name, Alan. We were talking about that before. <laughs> good <laughs> um, place too, man. God. Yeah, uh, it was a great. Gosh, it was a good man. cutover, but we knew. We knew we're like, hey, we got two years to like kill some bucks on this thing, and then it's it's over, and you got to go start over somewhere else, yeah. and that's exactly what happened. Now, Jacob, you killed some bucks in that. Killed two so, bucks. Killed yeah. two bucks Each in year. it, by God. Yeah. And then, but now, you know, after that year, it aged out, and, and that was it. And we had to go find something new um, because, like, just people don't really burn and or, or keep it. Yeah, you know, it's all timber country down here. That's where the money's at. Now, mm -hmm. Andrew, one thing you said was talking about Ben um, and how he noticed, like, when properties got cut, the, the buck quality would, you know, uptick. Mm -hmm. The thing about this property is managing it for that habitat forever mm -hmm. and keeping that quality. So there's not just an uptick, downtick. It stays high quality and you're attracting those other deer and you can kind of manage and also be a... Uh, kind of be an example for neighbors of what a property could look like when it comes to buck numbers, turkey numbers, hopefully get quail back in place, which we haven't talked about turkeys yet, but we'll talk about it in a little bit. Um, but, you know, have all those wildlife species that are thriving and your neighbors are going to benefit from it. There's going to be like, Jerry, he's probably going to kill some hell of a big deer oh, yeah. because of this property right here. But if he sees what your property's doing when in five years he can't hunt his property because it's a pine thicket yeah. and he can't see out that tower stand, which Jerry's one of Anthony's neighbors, it has a giant tower standing in the middle of this clear cut <laughs> and in about three to four years he ain't gonna be able to sit there no more yeah. um he's gonna he's gonna see what you're doing and get ex and even i don't know maybe i don't know maybe that conversation come up of like what are you doing in order to kind of attract these deer hold these deer but also grow these deer and it's not from a supplemental food program it's not just from food plots it's nothing from that it's truly from the habitat doing what the habitat has to offer and truly growing those exceptional deer, but also providing for other wildlife species as well, especially like the turkeys, which we never mentioned, but the last time you killed a turkey out here was 2016, I think we said, is that right? Uh, it's that bird right there, I don't even remember to be honest with I you. I think it was earlier than that, because I think I might've been in Arkansas when you shot that deer. I think it was like 2020, it was like when me and Marshall it, came up here. It was uh, 2010, 2012 actually. Oh, that's what I'm saying, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was in Arkansas at the time. So it's been 10 plus years since you've killed a bird out here. The last time you saw some birds, you saw some hens a couple years ago, saw mm -hmm. some long beards a few years ago, but they haven't really been on the property. One reason, because again, Alan and Kyle, you didn't see this beforehand, of what the property looked like before he came through and brush cut a lot of stuff. It was just thick, nasty, 
um, just 12, 14 foot tall, sweet Steve. gums and just yeah. privet yeah. and pines growing up. Like there's nothing underneath. It was really bad habitat for birds and they just weren't here. But kind of one of my selfish goals is get this property perf uh, get this property right for birds to come back, turkeys to come back. I can film Anthony kill a long beard hopefully next spring. Because um, they're definitely in this area. I mean, we're, we're pretty close to the river. We're pretty close to a lot of different habitat. There's definitely birds here. It's just they haven't been attracted to this property and stayed on this property, you know, throughout a season. So um, I think what's being done here and like that kind of the open of the terrain and kind of, you know, running fires, managing, which we're going to talk about fescue and bahia grass, which is, I knew about fescue, never knew about bahia grass. I've always wondered what that grass was in, in, in Allen. You're like, oh, that's, yeah, we, we, we talked about that on the first walkthrough, which is going to be a video we're going to put out. But managing for those, some of those species and, and t taking out those invasive species and, and bringing back, you know, a slightly different habitat so those poults and everything can thrive and you have your hens here, you're going to have your long beards here and everything else gets me super excited because the deer are here. It's like, you know, and as our buddy Nick Adair from the Good Night Yourself podcast says, you know, deer are like, co or deer are like cockroaches. They can live yeah. pretty much anywhere, any kind of environment. They can kind of, you know, get through it. Turkeys, quail are a lot more sensitive, especially quail. And it's like trying to focus on those species of the deer are going to do really good. But if we get the turkeys back here, it's going to be fantastic. Yeah, talking about clear cuts, I think a lot of it is that forb aspect. After the first few years, you get just an influx of forbs. And, uh, you know, these grasslands, they're called grasslands, but they're predominantly forbs. If they're not, then you should probably be burning in the fall to try to promote those forbs. But um, I think that's that. That's you know maintaining it as a grassland you know you're it's gonna you're keeping it in that stage of after a clear cut in perpetuity i guess uh perpet what whatever the word mm -hmm. oh, we're from yeah. alabama we can't think of <laughs> words. um what y'all know what i'm talking about but yeah perpetuity perpetuity there we go Got it. and uh and War so Eagle. it's gonna stay in that stage in, in perpetuity and uh and that's what's gonna hold i think that's what makes it great turkey habitat is having those forbs and quail as well because they're just seed factories they're just creating tons of seeds and attracting insects and then they're you know great for deer as well but anthony what was the quail like down here when you were growing up we had a, a good many flocks here mm -hmm. you know but back then it was like you know just a cattle farm they had room to move around like y'all were saying poults and the i guess they're chicks or quail I don't know what the little ones are called, but, uh, you know, so it wasn't this dense. Mm -hmm. like but it, it also probably wasn't what pastures look like now either. Yeah. You know, not bush hogged and manicured and sprayed with graze on yeah. every other year. Yeah. Um, it was probably, it probably had a lot of the gamma grass and the blue stem and a lot of these forbs out there then. Yeah. I imagine it did if that stuff's still out here. Yeah, so. especially as much as what's out here. Yeah, yeah there's a lot of it. Which, and that's a, that's a really, really interesting subject. And at the end of our walk the other day, we kind of talked about this. But uh, I kind of want to talk about, like, the seed bank and, and the idea of, like, how you can get the native habitat to come back. Because we're talking about how this place has been a cattle farm. It's been a pine plantation. Then it got cut. And now, I mean, you were... You were going crazy over one hillside. You're like, man, I could do guided tours out here. I could charge people, oh. you know, for the for the high quality stuff. Yeah, and, nice. and that stuff was in the ground this whole time for 50 years or whatever. And and you open the canopy up and it came back. So can you yeah. kind of talk about that a little bit? Yeah, and uh, that's where uh, the Jacob's finding a ton of beds. I mean, the deer are hanging out on it. Um, for some reason, that uh, it's an aster, and I can't remember the name of it. It's like the silver, like grass, like leaves. For some reason, the deer are loving to bed down and that stuff. Um, and it's short. It's only about 10 inches tall. Yeah. But it's surrounded by good stuff. But yeah. it's like it's it's like the best bedding that you – like the most – the the best mattress that there ever was yeah. for the deer. They love, yeah. to, they love to lay right there. Yeah. yeah. But um, that seed bank, it can uh, – you know, when those trees close everything out, those seeds can be in the soil the seeds – and a lot of times they're just hanging out there. It's just tiny little basil leaves, but really, you know, in a really unproductive stage, but they're just waiting on sunlight. They're waiting on a tree to fall or something to, to come back to life. And, and I see that in a lot of savanna remnants. You can find those plants even hanging out there, just tiny little basil leaves. But um, Basil is in B-A-S-A-L? Like yeah, just the, just the base leaves there pretty much waiting. They're never going to put on a flower. Mm -hmm. They're never going to be productive. They're just 
barely staying alive there, waiting on some you know good conditions to thrive. Basically, but, hibernating. Yeah, and that's much. why when I like do consultations, like. I love to point out things like that Illinois bundle flower that's back here. There's like, we only saw one little spot with Illinois bundle flower, but now that you know that's there, you can, you know, you, you can stay away from it on the bush hog and, you know, run fire through there and make sure that plant's going to be able to go to seed every year. And, uh, and once it's able to go to seed, those seeds, it's just multiplying every year and year after that. Um, you know, that one's probably was hit hard, uh, by having cattle out there. Cattle love grazing that one. So, um, there's a field, by us that's recently had cattle on it and just they wiped out the Illinois bundle flower but it's a good one for deer to graze on as well or browse on but um yeah that's what i love to do is point out those things because now that you know it's there you're able to keep an eye on it and make sure those plants are able to multiply every year we've got to talk about this you get so alan and kyle i want to get y'all's overall thoughts on the property and you've kind of mentioned some of the species but just again we kind of talk about the diversity or actually, I kind of want to pitch it to you so we don't have to go back and forth, but like just the overall diversity of this property and how much people would be willing to pay to have the diversity on this property on other places that are trying to get it and how much money people are willing to spend for some of these native habitat, some of these native grasses and forbs to be on their property and also like how much per pound some of that stuff is if you were to have to go buy that seed. Yeah, native seed is not cheap and it's not cheap for a reason because it's hard to harvest. Um, each species needs to be harvested a different way and so it's not very you know there's a lot of work that goes into collecting native seeds but being that you've got it here already i mean you've got i mean hundreds of thousands of of uh of uh goats root and if you were to buy that it was like three dollars for a pack of 60 seeds and there's like 1900 seeds an ounce and and it's like you know if you multiply that that's like thousands of dollars a pound for goat root seed like that's an it's crazy how much that stuff goes for and uh now that you've got illinois butterfly here i mean you're probably going to put on thousands tens of thousands of seeds off those plants that we saw today and so that's just free and now that you just have to allow them to go to seed and not bush hog it um, that's what happens a lot of time especially you know to places you know things like that butterfly weed we saw today that plant there's like 25 30 years old i mean they can get really old several years of bush hogging it that you know its tuber starves out and the plant dies um but each time you bush hog it that's one year it didn't go to seed and so that's super important if you want if you have a good seed bank making sure you're letting those native wildflowers you got there go to seed and then as a native habitat manager making sure the things you don't want there aren't going to seed as well like you know cerecia and invasive so if you want something to thrive, make sure that thing is able to flower and go to seed each year. And it's well, like the mm-hmm. the thing is, is you know, people that want to create this, they're starting with a fescue pasture. They're going to, have to spray it probably three times um, to kill everything that's there. Then they're going to plant it. Then they're going to watch for invasives. And then it's going yeah. to take three years for these flowers to even a lot of them to even bloom. Yeah. And so like they're a long way yeah. away from so, getting this yeah, and a lot of money. Yep. Yeah, you've already got it here and they're already mature. They're already producing a lot of seeds. So to make it better is going to be. I mean, your like results from one or two burns here are going to be crazy compared to the results from somebody who started from scratch three years ago and has uh, has done a native planting. It's put thousands of dollars into it. I mean, you're talking you know, a couple thousand dollars an acre to plant, uh, you know, a really nice prairie again. I mean, um, and sometimes if you want it more diverse, it's going to cost more than that. Sometimes you're talking a mix that has 30 to 40 species in it. Um, but I mean, that's going to cost you a lot. I've got fields that I've tried to have this kind of diversity. And I'm like, well, I'm just going to go spray the field and get rid of the non-native stuff and see what comes back. And then I get like four different species and I'm so disappointed. Yeah. And so, like, I will have to plant and buy seeds yeah. to replace what that looks like. Or it's just like ragweed and partridge beet, which are really beneficial plants. But those, like, those are super good native plants, but they're not high-quality prairie species like what you've got out here. Yeah. Those are just your basic pasture plant, you know, natives that when you kill off the fescue, that's what's going to come back. But So one interesting thing that we saw out there, especially today we were looking around, is all the pawpaws. And like mm-hmm. the different yeah. areas and the different types of pawpaws on this property. Kyle, can you talk a little bit about that? Because there was one spot we sat, we were talking, you're like, here's one, here's one. Like there was yeah. 30 coming up in a probably a, a 40 square foot area, maybe. Yeah. Um, there's so, um, I'm 
the scientific names I don't have off the top, top of my head or the common names, but I think it's small flowered pawpaw is the one that grows on upland sites. Um, and so those are the ones we've seen on top of the hills and those dry soils. And it's a shorter growing pawpaw tree. I mean, it might get head high at the most, um, but most of the time they're around your waist and they're making a smaller pawpaw fruit. But then you've also got the actual, um, um, I can't remember. It's the the common pawpaw that you see growing in river bottoms. Y'all have got that out here as well. And that one can get 20 foot tall and, I mean, as big around as your leg. Um, but, I mean, those little, um, you know, small flowered, small fruit pawpaws, I mean, those things were everywhere out here. And you just see those on dry prairies, dry, dry upland prairies. And so those would have been um, part of the shrub aspect of your savannas and woodlands. You've Y'all have got blueberries. Y'all have got... Um, plums Mm -hmm. you've got pawpaws you've got um, fragrant sumac you've got beautyberry um, you've got actual sumac um, and uh, you've got alabama croton which is that's uh, (laughs) a we haven't talked about that yet yeah that one grows in two counties in alabama and i think somebody informed me that it grows one place in in, uh, texas maybe but it's uh we're still going to call it an alabama endemic but it's a two counties in the state of Alabama. I think it's Bibb County and Shelby County. So to have that on your property is crazy, man. Like just growing here naturally. And uh they have like the you flip the leaves over and I'm talking it's silver like like I can't even describe how silver it is, it's, but it's really, really silver. And uh those leaves when in the fall they'll turn like a neon orange or crazy looking. But yeah, Alabama Croton growing out here. I think it needs that limestone, um, if I'm not mistaken. Um, maybe not, but uh, I think it does, and that's why you find it in these counties. Yeah, the also, you know, when it comes to like this property and overall, um, you know, because we're talking, you know, kind of specifically for whitetails here, but when you're talking about carrying capacity of a property, and we, you kind of mentioned earlier about, you know, savannas and prairie habitat, you know, can provide 2,000 to 2,500 pounds per acre of forage versus closed canopy forest at the very best could provide 250, but more likely it's 50 to 150 maybe pounds uh, per square acre. What is the carrying capacity difference between a property like this, even though it's, it's 90 acres, so it's not a giant property, but the carrying capacity on this property when it comes to like whitetail specifically compared to like some of his neighbors? Because again, if you look around here on aerial imagery, it's nothing but pine trees in most directions. Other than you go back towards one of the roads, you got some more kind of old pasture land but there's nothing like this place out there it depends on how those pines are managed but for the most part closed canopy pines are pretty unproductive um and it's going to be you know at best if it's like a thin stand of pine i'm guessing maybe four to five hundred pounds per acre if it's you know it's been thin Mm -hmm. several years ago Thin and burn not just sweet gum understory yeah yeah. Uh, even then you know it's it's not it's not really productive so um he's got a lot of potential out here the also another component about this property is if someone sees when people watch the film that we're putting out for this video that we did with you guys and there's gonna be a couple different clips coming out and it'll be out much later probably than this podcast is gonna come out of course but is we, we talked a little bit about plums in that video and we've talked about it a little bit on the podcast and plum thickets and especially like uh i know during the video we talked about chickasaw plums um, what is like the component of plums would uh, provide in a landscape like this? Like, wh- how are they naturally on the landscape, and what kind of cover type does that provide for different wildlife species? And why is it important on landscape? And we come to find out there's actually plums. Andrew, you didn't see it. We found a bunch of plums. Uh, oh, there's yeah. there, oh. I, there's some I didn't even knew about that some. Anthony had. He had some there. <laughs> oh, really? Giant, we were eating plums earlier. Yeah. Oh man, I want some plums. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, what what do, what do plums provide when it comes to like a habitat, both from like a food source, but also like a structure cover type for different wildlife species? Yeah, so they're a great food source for all kinds of animals. You know, deer and and turkey and quail all will all, will all eat plums and their pits. Um, and then you know they're flowering shrubs, so they're great for pollinators. Prunus species are like excellent for insects. Um, but uh, then they're pro- for providing a lot of cover as well. They got that thorny, you know, shrubby component, and uh, they kind of have that umbrella effect for uh, for quail and turkey poults. So they can run around underneath, and they're protected from aerial predators, and that's super important in, sur- in making sure you have brood survival. Um, so thickets, thickets. I mean, that's something we do not talk about nearly enough, like native thickets, and I think that's because 
we have so many non-native thickets replacing them in the southeast now so um but native thickets man like that should be something everybody's trying to put on their property we got hazelnuts and plums and i mean a lot of those shrubs are named earlier pawpaws and and y'all got a y'all had a spice bush out here like it, it there's a shrub for everywhere and, and they're going to be great for great cover for deer and you know other game species and they're most of them produce berries and uh for some reason most thicket forming shrubs are very good berry and and uh seed producer so that's super beneficial for wildlife yeah the uh and you want them scattered across the landscape like if you've got an open grassland you don't want it to be just 80 acres of grassland you're going to want you know pockets of shrubs scattered across it you know like about as far as you can throw a baseball you want to have you want to have a you know a pocket of a little shrub component um, down in the black belt, I've got tons and tons and tons of these little um, plum thickets, and you know, I've been running fire through there for years. Well, what happens is, is you'll kind of get they kind of like grow in rings, and so like you kind of have some in the center where the fire doesn't really get to, and because uh, the they'll they'll kind of grow down in like almost like a pyramid shape, and so like the ones around on the edge, they kind of get burnt back just a little bit every year. Well, then that's you know lower, you know one one and a half to two foot tall. And it just stair steps up. Then ones in the middle, they may be 10 or 12 feet tall. Mm, and yeah. so you've got the different diversity of, you know, when a quail or a turkey poult is out there feeding in the forbs and everything, and then an avian predator comes down, well, those things don't, they don't want to have to go very far, dive off in and hide. Yeah. And so they can get in and, you know, like we said, an umbrella effect, well, a, a hawk or something's not going to be able to dive down through that plum thicket to attack those, those mm. baby poults. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that's interesting. And also, uh, there's a couple other species I want to kind of touch on. Um, one being post oak, uh, which is kind of interesting. So I know uh, Cobbett kind of holds near near to your heart because I think that's your logo for yeah. Dave Habitat Road, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's a uh, as a forester who likes grasslands, that's kind of like the the symbol I chose. But it's like when you find post oaks, it's a really good sign of savanna. So if you're looking for remnant savannas, like you got to think the first thing to go are your grass and grasses and forbs. The next things to go are going to be your plum thickets. They're going to get shaded out and out competed, but post oak can usually survive. They might, instead of being a sprawling out post oak, they might have to turn into more of like a timber tree and grow straight up. But you're usually going to have uh, post oaks hanging around because they can live three to 400 years. So if you're looking for a remnant prairie or remnant grassland, um, Savannah, you know, look for post oaks so usually in those savannah your our savannas in the southeast were usually made up of post oaks blackjack oaks chinkapin oaks really any of your upland oak species um, hickories shortleaf pine longleaf pine um, loblolly pine in some places like it's that we we had it's usually the fire dependent species and so if you look at something like post oak they they're really fire tolerant um, and their leaves tell you that because their leaves are uh, when you drop them on the ground when they drop on the ground just think about walking through certain species of oaks how crunchy those post oak leaves are really lofty they make this huge dense bed that's very very it's burned really really well but then look at like your bottom land oak species well water oak and willow oak you don't have that those their leaves don't burn really well because they're not fire uh, adapted they don't really necessarily need fire or want fire um, and it might harm them or kill them a lot easier than a post oak or a white oak so um but yeah when you're looking for a prairie remnant post oaks are always the first thing to look for and there's some big really big post oaks out here there's that one tree you really like that's got all the willow or it's got all the water oak saplings and everything kind of grew up around it but it's got all those sprawling limbs we have limbs that are three feet off the ground that reach out for 35 feet off that tree yeah uh which is kind of interesting and again i never knew that's what it was i was like i was you know some oak i don't know exactly what it is but and then you look around the property after anthony came through and used that brush cutter and, and just cleared out a lot of stuff and you know he did this in march or he did this in february and it's some of the stuff's already two and a half three feet tall some you know some of the sweet gum saplings are coming back four feet tall but you see all these post oak saplings everywhere like in different pockets it seems like they're kind of popping up which again kind of you know represents that you know this was you know prairie at some point or yeah. you know savannah habitat um, and like you were mentioning to us when we were walking around, they do really well with fire, so you can burn it. You're not going to, you're probably not going to kill those saplings, those, those sprouts. 
and it's just trying to manage exactly how many of those you know saplings do you want to turn into trees and again so it doesn't get close canopy you know kind of manage it with herbicide and everything making sure you know you still have that kind of savanna component or maybe have different pockets of those you know post oaks but they don't just take over yeah. uh, in that case yeah you don't want to get too dense of, of tree cover and and uh there's kind of a i don't know that's that's kind of fire doesn't always you these savannas need disturbance to stay open and fire doesn't always do it but we would have t we would have normally had a you know a component of herbivory you know with large large herbivores coming through here and that would have really helped out a lot but um you know and these days you can kind of replicate that with cattle somewhat but it's like it's tougher to do it's really it's you not gotta, the same no we gotta we got that's where we got to come in and like all right here we don't want this to become too dense of a of a savanna we want to cut back some trees but mm -hmm. Also, so I want to get to like kind of exciting, and this is all exciting, but another exciting part of this podcast is the huntability of this form now, and I kind of want to pitch it to you a little bit. After walking the property a few times and I was talking to Anthony, what is your thought process on like the huntability of this property? Because some people, they look at it, and from a bow hunter, like, man, I don't have enough trees to go sit in and all that kind of stuff because I don't have a huge expanse of timber. What is your thought process looking at the property, walking the property from like a huntability standpoint? Well, it can be really, really good. Um, you know, some properties you look at, you kind of have an outside-in approach, and then some are going to be more of an inside-out approach. And the way this property sets out really sets up really good. He doesn't have great access all the way around the property, but some of the the primo bedding areas that we saw where deer are already selecting to bed mm -hmm. is kind of only the the outside, not necessarily on the outside edge, but you know, you can leave the deer safe and secure around that part and you can slip into the middle of the property where you know you're down in a bottom the wind should be you know drawing down into that bottom especially in the afternoon hunt mm -hmm. um on those those cool days where the the temperature's falling it's not a super windy day it's just going to suck all your wind right straight down to the bottom and and uh and you'll be able to access in and out through those areas really really well and leave those secure bedding areas you know just slightly up above you to where the all the, the food's down here and they're coming they're wanting to come down here to feed in the evenings and stuff and so like huntable you know pick and there's several spots that were, were ridge tops that were really really great it's got really really good access where you can just slip in to the side and mm -hmm. just ba basically peek in see where the deer are and slip out without anything knowing you're there and that's that's what you know this property really does have a great setup on it also um with all that when we're talking about creating bedding areas or enhancing bedding areas you know we went around to a few spots that are like historically like bedding locations most yeah. of them were you know ridge points side of big ridges stuff like that one of them is the rock garden which is kind of like a glade on the property that's now really thick but typically that's an area that especially during the rut you have a lot of bucks kind of in that area when it comes to like enhancing some of those bedding areas you were kind of talking a little bit about you know doing like a mixture you talk about a third approach like yes. thirds can you talk about a little bit about that yeah so when you select these these bedding areas where you want to define the bedding you know a lot of times the deer are they they love to have you know something that they can bed up against like a down tree or a log or something like that some type of structure um that they will go and and seek out and so when you're going in these bedding and he's got some spots that are that, that they didn't get the mulcher into and it's still pretty you know closed canopy super super stemmy and so you look for trees that um that deer like to select for to browse such as your elm um, maple different things like that you'll you'll actually just flush cut them don't kill them um, that's just more deer food and you want them to have food where they bed and, and uh, so you'll 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 flush cut a third of those like select trees that deer prefer to browse and cut a third of those then you'll go in there so you've got some sweet gum some poplar some different stuff like that you know you can hinge some of those you know some of your sweet gums you're going to want to treat and kill with herbicide but hinge some trees down you know don't go crazy hinge cutting everything um, you don't want to make a big mess of everything but hinge cut about a third of it and then select any of your invasive species like there's lots of privet um, even you know, a lot of sweet gum um, a lot of trees that you are undesirable they're not going to be deer food um, go in there and you you hack and squirt or flush cut and treat the stump to where that tree is now dead and you're going to have more of a grassy component come back or you know Forbes and this place is loaded with Forbes it's probably going to be a lot of Forbes come back mm -hmm. um, and so then you've got you know a herbaceous layer 
of, of stuff in there, but then they've also got that structure that they seek out and love to find. And and will then you you're gonna have to find bedding. You're gonna know. Hey, look, I got a picture of this deer this morning. He's headed back to the bedding area. I know exactly where he's going go, to go lay. And you're gonna be able to plan a hunt much better, knowing that. Hey, this pocket, this pocket, this pocket, this pocket. This mm-hmm. is where they're going to be when they go in bed down. That's the place they're going to select. As opposed to being just one whole entire ninety acres of bedding, you don't really know exactly where. You don't have defined bedding. You don't know. Well, I think they're bedding over that way. Mm-hmm. Well, you could miss him by fifty yards. Yep. When they're like that. Yeah, and, and also when it comes from huntability, you know, if you're running trail cameras out here, which I know Anthony does, like you said, you give an example up there on the spot that's the, the called the barn, uh, this main ridge right here off the back side of the house. <clears throat> There's that thick spot to the north that sets up. You have a couple two small ridge points that drop off. That you know, deer are already bedding there, but they right. can be tremendously enhanced doing like what you're talking about. And if you catch a buck, you put a mock scrape up there, and you catch a buck in the morning going back that direction right around daylight or just after daylight. You know he's bedded in that spot, and that's a spot you can slip in, especially early season, slip up that tree yeah. and hunt, potentially catching him coming back out, checking that mock scrape, hitting the food plot, hitting the watering hole before he decides to drop down at elevation to a, a larger food source, a you know, bigger food plot or something of sorts. Exactly. Um, and that's kind of like the exciting thing out of here, because again, I think a lot of people, like, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, like when it was not this open, but it's still pretty open. And I remember me and Anthony talking about like, man, there's not a lot of places to put tree stands in. But if you, you now, like you have the opportunity to put, you know, whether it's plum thickets in or different kind of travel quarters, you can kind of make your travel quarters where you can run those deer by those stands. Like you were talking about cutting fire breaks, cutting those trails, kind of quartering off some of these trees where it comes by 25 yards. And these deer are gonna use these cut trails and there's a bunch of cut trails on this property where you kind of funnel those deer right past you where you have an awesome bow opportunity, even though you're in a little bit more of an open stand. It's not like you're in like a dense cover where you're hunting a feed tree per se. Right. You're catching right. them coming from bed, going down to one of the food plots or coming across one of the ridge lines browsing and you have them kind of slip right by you. You get an opportunity to be able to shoot them you know, with your bow or during rifle season, you can actually be probably a little bit less invasive on this property because uh, you can kind of back up a little bit and you can see a little bit more. You can kind of have a visual and try to figure out what you need to do in order to get an opportunity out of deer. Absolutely. And you know, you, you just, you've just got a better plan in place. I mean, it, you're, you're, you're not just going in there and hoping, well, one's going to walk by here. You're going to go in there and you're going to set up because you know they're betting right here. You know they're traveling right here. You're going to have a lot more confidence about a stand because you've got defined betting and and, and a defined um, travel corridor, a defined movement. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Uh, Anthony, let me, let me pitch this back to you. After doing this whole walk and talking to the guys and everything, what gets you now excited about the property after kind of learning a lot more? Because I know you probably had a lot dropped on you because this is the second yeah. time I've come out here. I've got excited every time I come out here. I was, Wait, we, you, you know, mean we've been about, dumping too much information? <laughs> yeah, it is, it's, it's a, a lot. Bit. But what kind of, like, after learning so much, what's kind of got you even more excited about, like, the opportunity you have on the property? Besides seeing you with a backpack sprayer for hours on the <laughs> <laughs> you know, I need to ask these guys a question about consulting aspect of it like kyle setting up that savannah we saw all the post oaks and the all the you know i've got names that you know i've never heard of <laughs> we talked about flagging tape man yeah. it's gonna be flagging tape everywhere <laughs> yeah. yeah so we actually go out there and and flag a post oak that we want to yeah do I'll, here and then 50 yards away do you know yeah, i would and that's that just makes it easier so um you know if you come out here and, and flag it, then when you turn Jacob loose on this place with a chainsaw, yes. you know, when he's out here doing That's his work dangerous. days. That's real dangerous. <laughs> yeah. That's the chainsaw. I'm just going to put that out there and, and then, keep going. You don't have to worry about it. He knows what to cut and yeah, what the, not to cut. The Myers with chainsaws, we, we don't want to. Oh, use. gosh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. yeah. But that's how – that's, you know, I always mark them just so, you know, just get out there and get a plan originally, and you, you'll probably, as you're cutting it, find a few things that you want to save and – um, you might end up having to take some of those out that you marked originally, but um, that's how I usually like to do it, just to have a good plan. And then, and then it's easier to mark them now in the summertime, and then in the wintertime when you're in there and there's no leaves on there, you know which ones you know right. were what. And so it's easier to identify those oaks right now. And then when you when it's cooler and you do want to be running a chainsaw, like 
It's uh, you don't have to think about it. What is that a post oak or is that something else? You know, and then you'll start learning once you see what they look like in the summer, what you see what they look like in the winter. You'll be able to look at a yeah. tree in the winter time and judge it by its bark. And yeah. then you'll also have a good representation of like, hey, I know that one was a post oak because yeah. I marked it was. Yeah. And then you go and you have something to compare it to. Yeah. So that's that's why I, I like to do that usually, but um, you know, I don't do that all the time now, but. Um, when I, back in the day when I was in that situation where I couldn't identify a post oak in the winter time is definitely I think an important part of of going through there and knowing what to save and what not to mm-hmm. yeah absolutely yeah dude I'm just so excited because again storyline is like I think the deer just continue to get better and better as I just want turkeys to come back and if we have turkeys come back I'll be so happy like just try because I mean Anthony's gonna kill them you know bird or two this yeah, coming spring I mean, on camera you know it's been neglected I mean I'll be first one to say you know but i'm living here now so i'm ready to get to work and and uh so i'm excited i'm i'm scared to get on a tractor now and bush hog <laughs> you know everything y'all been pointing out i don't want to damage anything yeah. and, uh, <laughs> so you know but i'm ready i'm ready so getting this excited. time of year is not really the greatest time to bush hog yeah no, no. i'm not getting on. <laughs> <laughs> no. uh, w- w- one other thing i was going to mention so, like we mentioned earlier in the podcast, High Tower that buck sit between you guys, uh, both Anthony and Kyle, that deer was kind of an anomaly, as in specifically body size. Like rack, yeah, like there's been some big deer here, but like that mass on that deer is very special. Um, and kind of like the goal, I feel like, is make that not an anomaly. That is, that is in a few years, three, four years, you know, make it where you have deer of that caliber and then some on this property, you know, every single year to be able to target. Um, I mean, but then again, maybe I should pay attention to you, Anthony, more of the photos you sent me because you had a couple lashes that are jot. Yeah, like, I mean, you had that 10 point. And like, Hightower's a big deer. That 10 point, maybe it was just the angle you had him in the trail camera was a freaking stud. I mean, there's there's been deer. Uh, like I told you, there's two types of frames of racks. Like the 10, you know, that I call him short brow 10. Mm-hmm. I mean, he was six and a half years old. But that spread like that. Wide, kind of a more wide, wider frame, tall. high tower frame. Tight. Tight, like stickers mm-hmm. for deer. You know, he had a frame just like this. He just had tons of trash. Anthony, hold that. Hold him up, like, for the camera and everything. Again. Kind of turn him a little bit left and right. Yeah, like, yeah, give us a good look at that thing. So, yeah, we had a deer. I had one encounter with stickers. And, I mean, he just had who knows how many points but it was just all trash but he had the same frame like this so i mean i've had a lot of a lot of big deer you know on camera i've just never connected Mm -hmm. with them you know so they're here now probably not the body size of high tire yep and i think you know the the habitat has played a huge role in getting him to where he was how, to kind of close this out here, I want to hear about how that hunt actually went down for him because you had his, like several years of history with him, right? So, yeah. I mean, like when did you first notice him? What was that progression like? First picture is 2019. Uh, I got, you know, 2000, you know, 20, 21. Killed him November 22nd of 22. So, uh you know had a history with him uh never had a daytime picture of him i had the first daytime picture was a week before i shot him and i was just moving trail cameras around trying to pinpoint you know like i said living here i had a lot more time to get out there and do that sort of thing so uh Actually, I was telling the guys earlier that I went out and the weather guessers <laughs> said it was going to be a northwest <laughs> wind. <laughs> so I went to a stand where I, I got a picture of him. And I hung that stand and uh, saw him for the first time. Uh, it was an afternoon hunt and uh, went, that was a week before. Went back the day I, I shot him, you know, supposed to have a northwest wind, and that was perfect for that stand. Uh, got in there, sat up, 
uh, set up and it was northeast just constant so i said man i gotta get out of here so jumped down ran up to the next ridge and i was just up there to really shoot a doe it was the power pole you know y'all seen the power pole not and, sketchy uh, at all <laughs> yeah uh, so jumped up there had a uh, crossbow and compound with me and like i said i wasn't even thinking high tower at that point and uh you know it was right at last light i heard a deer wind still blowing northeast deer coming behind me and you know it was right like i said right at last light and i said well that's the day i'm about to get busted this is it you know and got right here and i just turned and looked and i saw a rat and uh you know just couldn't believe it i mean i still don't believe it, you know <laughs> november 22nd i mean i normally shoot bucks early yeah and during the rut you know and him he came you know downwind like i said i thought i was busted and mm. uh you know shot him with a crossbow because i couldn't i knew i couldn't pull back the compound and see him through the peep sight so uh and that was that was pretty much it and let me tell you anthony was a mess he called oh, me after he shot yeah. him. And he called me, and he's like, dude, I shot a shot high tower. And, like, I'd seen photos of him, but he didn't, he doesn't share a lot of photos. So, like, I've heard of this deer. Like, Christopher, my brother, knew, knew more about this deer than I did. And uh, he's like, oh, I shot high tower. I'm like, oh, cool, dude. And like, he's like, I mean, shook. He called me when we get back to the house. Like, dude, I stood in the stand for, like, an hour. Yeah, I, I didn't know there where he went. Yeah, I stayed 45 minutes because the pole is already shaking. <laughs> and I was shaking. So I had to it's calm down pole. to get down the shaky it, pole. It's an actual we, got, we got to talk about the pole You, you took an auger up there. You took an auger up there, right? Drilled a hole and then put that no, in? That His post hole? Up. Oh, no way. Well, dude. hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. All right, explain the pole, the placement. of the, what, what are we talking about here? Well, we had... It was the cedar tree is what we called it. Yeah. Well, I ran a fire through there, killed my cedar tree. <laughs> and, and you had a stand in that I had tree. A stand that was that, just a that jam was up stand. For fifteen years, I guess. <laughs> the cedar tree. Hey, I'm going to the cedar tree. You knew where we were going. Ran a fire through there and it was a you know, brushy cedar, reached the ground and I toasted that thing. <laughs> so I had to find another spot and there's, you know, isolated white oaks right there. So that was kind of the draw. We do have a field right there, but uh, there was a pine that, you know, we had in it right next to it for, for a years. couple of years. You had to stand in there for a year or two, and then Chris yeah. was like, I can't reach around it. You couldn't reach her. I mean, it was dangerous. I'd rather climb the shaky pole than. That's what I asked. I said, why is it not in that pine tree? You they, they can't reach around that thing. They were, yeah, yeah scared. Hanging the stand, putting your stand yeah. back down. It's sketchy. Kind of get it set up. So correctly. I have a business. Uh, we had a pole laying there. I was like, man, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go put that pole up because I don't really have a place to put a stand now. So myself and my two sons went up there and hand dug like six feet down. <laughs> you know, with a dig bar post old days now i know why jacob don't come out here <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i ain't built yeah. for that Listen, so I dishwasher hands. had my skid steer we propped it up you know packed it with 8910 limestone and uh i i've been wanting to go set some cables up you know to <laughs> tighten it up a little bit to say we secure when we, it we put a corner post in the ground we always brace it yeah <laughs> i've been wanting to do I that brace on this one dude yeah. you for it. years hey, i just never have i came up know. here late last summer or maybe a year whenever you put it up and i saw you climb it, and that sucker you're climbing it and i'm you like that thing's moving this. more than like a an 18 inch pine tree you're going up just like kind of going back and forth as you're going up that ladder that stick ladder no yeah, thing with a pine you have limbs just in case you you know that's hilarious. You could grab on to, but you don't have nothing. In I'm place. always thinking like, man, I wish there's a tree right here to put my trail camera on. But you took it a step further, yeah. man. <laughs> You're like, you just put a freaking pole in the ground. You made to climb a stand up. site, kind of brushing. So you know, I got, I made my own lifelines. I have lifelines and all my client, you know, my lock ons. So, but when you get up there, you don't stand it. How many feet yeah. is it up that stand? How many feet up is that stand placed at? You think? I don't know. Eighteen, maybe. Six feet. Yeah, feet. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Too high. I don't know. I mean, I'm not. I, yeah. It's, it's in the teens for sure. I know that. Yeah. But 
But so you shot him out saying, so kind of going back to the story, when you called me, that, that pole was shaking, because of course, yeah. after the fact. So yeah. you had to sit there for a while to chill out. I couldn't out. believe it. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. You know, I just shot a high tower. You know, we, we were talking earlier, it's like, you feel kind of bad, you know, that you have a history with a deer and then you finally take him, you know, you feel kind of sad and yeah. excited at the same time. So yeah, I, you know, had to calm myself down. And I thought I heard him crash, you know, when I shot, you know, I was, he was quartering like this and I put it back on the ribs, aiming for the offset shoulder. And I think I hit him a little forward. So, you know, I was running like everybody. I was running the shot through my mind, you know, but I said, when I shot, he ran down and I thought I heard him crash. So I'm, you know, feeling good, but, you know, not sure because it's high tower, you know. So get down, I call, I think I called my buddy Brian. Mm -hmm. uh, well, beard landscaper. Beard landscaper. And then. Uh, that's his brain, guys. Yeah, that's not yeah. his nickname. Anyway, sorry. But and then I called. <laughs> Funny guy. Called you, called Michael, my brother. <clears throat> I said, man, I, you know, both of you, I just, I just shot high tower. You know? So. <laughs> And then uh, I said, I thought I heard him crash. And I said, I'm going back, get Bailey, because she's helped track some deer before, and I take her on any bow shot just to, you know, train her. And uh, so I actually drove my truck. After I kind of undressed, got everything, got a good flashlight and everything, drove my truck to just up the hill and parked it there so we walked out and i get out to where i you know i made the shot and the bolts actually right laying right over there i find the fletching end of the of the bolt and uh you know decent blood and uh so i shine the light just forward a little bit 10 yards and i hear this commotion oh no and i'm like oh my gosh i just jumped him and i just i just died you know <laughs> that's you talking about shook up i was <laughs> you know, sick and i was like there's no way you know i thought i made a good shot so i called you back because you were on the way with mm -hmm. pepper. pepper called brian back called you know called everybody back it's like, man, I just, I think I just jumped him, you know. So, you know, I actually sent y'all pictures of the bowl. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what do y'all think? Mm -hmm. Had just tons of fat on it. Yeah, I was like, Br a brisket shot. And everybody's like. going, it's a brisket. And I was like, man, don't tell me that. You know, <laughs> that's just making me feel worse, dude. You know? So, uh, I just, I think I asked you and... I, I just told y'all to turn around, you know, because... Yeah, I was like, we'll just get him in the morning. Yeah. yeah. I was like, what What would you do, you know, after y'all saw the picture of the bolt? And I think you just told me to back out and mm -hmm. not go back the next Yeah, because that was like, it was 10 o'clock at night, yeah, I think. Yeah. 10 or 11. Because I remember, I literally about, I went to the gas station. He called me. I'm about to crack open an energy drink because I'm, I'm worn out. We did something <laughs> that day. I was like super tired. I think I'm about hunted that day. So I'm like about to crack an energy drink at 11 o'clock at night to get out there. And I was about to crack it. He called me like, thank God. I'm like, I ain't going to drink that now. I won't be able to go back to sleep, dude. I have to go down to the farm and just hang out with Anthony because he ain't going to go to sleep tonight. No. <laughs> so I, I talked to Michael for a minute, my brother. I was like, what would you do? And uh, he said, I'd wait four hours. And all I, want, all I wanted to see was see blood. That's all I wanted. If I walked down in there and it was not good, just bright red or what have you, and I didn't see any kind of bubbles or any kind of lung, you know, evidence of a lung shot or anything, okay, I'm going to back out and let him lay. So it was, I think I, do, I sat right here, matter of fact, turned TV on and, you know, just kept running the shot through my mind and was sick and, you know, few Coors Lights might have been involved. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, I just sat here. I think I dozed off one time. 
and uh because i i'd worked that day and uh before i went out you know and so i was tired and then i was miserable you know thinking i'd blown it but uh so it was 12 30 you know november 23rd had rolled in and uh i got up left bailey here i walked didn't take the truck or anything didn't want you know i want to be as quiet as possible and i made i don't know 20 steps found blood bubbles all in it and i was like oh yes you know felt a lot better kept walking found actually lung on some brush so i felt real confident then so he was right where i heard him crash he was dead it was the commotion i heard had to be other deer or something in there you know Mm -hmm. that there was a scarlet oak down there and like backtrack i don't know four or five days before i actually saw some deer down in there feeding so i don't know if some other deer had moved in there and uh you know that's what i heard Mm -hmm. when i went in there first and uh but went over there and he was i mean he'd rigamore just he was he was done i mean i hit him right where i was aiming basically because it come out his armpit on the opposite shoulder and come to find out when we skinned him he was full of, i mean just oh, fat yeah. all that's, over that's, that's where, where it was. all the fat yeah. it's typically you know Can, deer around here. yeah yeah typically deer around here you have it on their chest but you don't have fat on the side or on their hips or anything and that mm-hmm. deer i mean he had it looked like an iowa deer i mean he had yeah. fat all over him and uh I'm like, that's what it was when it came out it just caught all that fat on his chest and yeah. whatever so it made it look like a brisket hit, but it wasn't so yeah. but y'all both told me that and y'all just made me sick <laughs> <laughs> so I, you know i suffered for a yeah. little bit but and he, that deer didn't go 50 yards probably yeah, they from didn't. where he hit him and where he was dead so uh and then we came in the next day and, and uh you gotta see that deer in person and i was blown away how big that deer was body was like rack was crazy impressive but like i saw his body and saw his neck i took photos put my boot next to his neck i mean that deer I don't, I don't know what the measurement on that deer's neck was but i mean it is as big as my iowa deer it was nearly as big as my iowa deer killed back in 2021 and that deer uh live weight was like 255. Um, this deer wasn't quite that big but he it was all all of his weight was in his chest and his neck i mean that yeah. deer you talk about front heavy i mean it was crazy how big that body was on that deer on his front half you know hind quarters not so much but the front half it was huge but um just a crazy deer but again crazy story but it's kind of but it's kind of funny like that deer you know he started date you know he, he you know you had a little daylight action saw him everyone kill him but it seems like based off of what we've seen on this property you know he's had camera history with, with his deer over the last few years deer is probably six and a half maybe seven and a half years old um based off trail camera trail camera data he's had on that deer but with the early sessional habitat and everything that's on this property, it seems like that deer was drawn back to this property as he got more age on him and as some of that stuff got more and more open. So kind of goes back to, you know, that deer's an anomaly or was an anomaly, but let's try to make that not an anomaly yeah. based off the habitat management of this property. It kind of comes full circle this, on this property and this podcast of, you know, that's the kind of deer that want to be producing and others kind of like the big 10, like that y'all got the big 10 he had. I mean, Alan, I'm not saying it's like, you got some giant deer, okay? But for down here, that Big Ten's a freaking monster. Well, and don't let let that be average. Let yeah. let let that oh, set the that. bar you... higher every time. Because if you <laughs> just get complacent yep. of, well, yeah, we got a good deer this year. Well, you're you're robbing yourself of something that can be really really great. Yep. Especially because you talk so much about age structure and letting those deer get that age on it. And, and if and you ha- look at that deer, both of his G twos, mm-hmm. he's wanting to put some stickers on. He's got it there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And like the webbing on that left G2 yeah. as well. It's, you know, it's just super cool. But like you said, yeah, like, if that's the average deer, Anthony, you might, I might have to pay you some money to come out here and hunt, dude. I mean, listen, we might need, a, we might need a, a deer for the podcast, you know, kill on camera we'll or something. We'll harvest like. seed, make some money, yeah. and I'll. Uh, there you go. We'll go get some go through seed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll yeah. strike it big. Freaking $1,500 a pound or whatever it was. Crazy <laughs> stuff. But um, awesome. Well, uh, Alan, Kyle, do y'all have any kind of, just final thoughts just kind of you know final thoughts on the podcast and property and kind of moving forward potentially with the property and maybe what y'all would like to see or just overall thoughts on everything i mean great property i was i was pleasantly surprised with how what you know the quality that was here so really i mean fire 
I mean, that's what this place needs big time. So I think it's a, you're well on your way to having a really great property. It's already, you're already way above average. So for sure. For sure. Yeah. Awesome, man. Uh, I, to kind of close this out, uh, Anthony, first of all, thanks for letting us come out here and, mm-hmm. and film this stuff and, and record podcasts on it and talking to us this has been awesome. Uh, Kyle, and Alan, both of y'all are doing awesome work. So thank you guys for coming out here and sharing your knowledge and everything. Uh, Kyle, where can people find you and kind of follow along with your stuff? Um, Native Habitat Project on most social medias. Um, you can just visit our website and and uh, you can find our contact information on there. And if you're uh, if you're looking for somebody to set up a property that can uh, to really hunt it, Alan's your guy. Um, I can I can point out some plants, but um i can i can't hunt as good as this guy over here so <laughs> but uh he's he's great at setting up places so yeah. alan what about you man mm-hmm. yeah so you can find me on their page as well um if you'd like to email me um it's hunt at native habitat project.com also um i'm with langan legacy now so either way whichever way you want to go we're we're there yeah heck yeah man well i'll, I'll link those two I'll, I'll link native habitat project and land legacy uh, down in the description so people can go find that pretty easily and get in contact with you guys uh jacob you got anything else for no I w- i'll just say this i learned so much in the last week and a half out here like there's so many planes out here i was like oh that's some kind of weed and they come to find it, it was like oh no it's legumes everywhere like this is a high protein it's you know putting on you know some uh, body weight in these deer got real really excited about so i would say if you're a landowner and you're interested in learning more about your property and what you could potentially do with your property, I would highly recommend about getting these guys out in the place. Uh, just cause there's so much you could learn just from them of looking at different species and what your property is providing, but also from like a huntability standpoint, how can you use that native habitat to work for you where you're not spending 80% of your time, like Alan said on our first podcast we did with you, 80% of your time on food plots, instead of putting 80% of your time in food plots, put it on the native habitat and then 20% in your food plots and really kind of manage it more well-rounded. And I think you'll be super happy because again, I'm super excited how this property, see how this property plays out over this year, run some fires on it and um, and then for years to come. So super exciting. And again, greatly appreciate you guys for coming out. Yeah, your mind's going to be blown because we've just seen it in a basically one week apart yeah. and basically the same stuff's blooming that we saw last week. Yeah. But there's going to be so much more bloom throughout the summer and all the way into the fall. And also we missed a whole bunch early yep. spring. So like you're going to start coming out here once a month and seeing something new and get to learn new plants and get to learn new things. And now you're, you've got the eye to look for it. Like you're not going to just walk through there and it just looks like a bunch of green grass or weeds. Yep. You're going to start noticing, Oh man, there's that, there's this. I mean, it, and it's going to blow your mind. Yeah, you can't appreciate what you don't know about, and so it takes getting out there and looking looking around. So, Awesome. Well, guys, appreciate y'all listening and watching this podcast. Getting to a video podcast now, so if you're audio listener, you can actually go over to YouTube. And, Andrew, by this point, is it going to be up on Apple Podcasts, video podcast? Uh, no, just YouTube. Just YouTube right now. Just okay, YouTube. Cool. So just YouTube right now. You can go watch this podcast if you decide to. Um, and, guys, this makes sure you tune in for this week's Friday – well, not Friday. This outro. We're rebranding everything. This outro episode, we talked a little bit more about this and some other stuff we got going on, maybe some scout trips we just got done. So appreciate y'all joining us for this week's podcast episode of Southern Outdoorsman, and we'll catch y'all back from the on the next episode from the Southern Outdoorsman podcast.